uh, if you're ready to start, then I'm going to get you started. We've had plenty of applause, so now, now it's time to do something. do something. Thanks for coming. Bye. <laughs> it's been a while since I've uh, I've done this. I I retired two years ago, and uh, the last time I you know did anything at Expo was for Dialed In. Uh, which I heard horrible things about on the internet for like the next 10 years. <laughs> um, so I, first of all, I, I, there's a few people I have, more than a few people I have to thank, but the first person uh, we have to thank is uh, Rob. Um, <laughs> you know, I, my memory isn't as good as it used to be, but I'm pretty sure that Expo wasn't this size. I w the first Expo I went to was two years after he started. And I, I don't remember it being this size. I remember this room being all of Expo. <laughs> okay, and, and to see what he's been able to accomplish over 40 years for pinball uh, is amazing, and one more time, give it up for him. Uh, real quickly, I have to thank Mrs. Pat. Mrs. Pat is uh, is our AV person tonight, um, and and I also have to warn you if you're looking for a large corporate multimedia extravaganza, you're at the wrong uh, thing. It, this is not going to be it. Uh, we, you know, we, we do this as a bootstrap kind of thing, and uh, we do the best we can, and we move on. Um, the other people I have to thank are uh, sitting behind me. Um, when, when Rob called me, and asked if I would do, he first of all asked if I'd do the Pat Lawler show again. And, and I said no. Um, the Pat Lawler show is long, is long past its heyday, okay? Um, we had a lot of fun doing it. I loved doing it every year. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm 72 years old and I can no longer do Pratt Falls off the stage. So <laughs> I said, let me think about what you know, to Rob, let me think about what I can do for 40th anniversary. Uh, and I called him back a couple of days later and I said, look, this isn't about me. This is about 40 years of pinball. And in that 40 years of pinball, or a little more in the case of what we're going to talk about tonight, um, I met, I was lucky to have met some of the most talented people on the planet. And I got to work with them. And they're behind me. And I said I'd like to get them all together. I'd like to walk through what it was like in their shoes to do their job and, and to bring you these games and what it meant to them and, you know, people don't always see the business side of what we do. Every day for the people who do this, it's a job, right? You get up in the morning, you, you know, you get dressed, you go to work, and somebody wants to beat on you and tell you that the idea you had is terrible. And they manage to stick it out for, you know, 40 plus years. The other thing I'm grateful for was when they saw the call information on their phones, they still answered. Um, and uh, with the with the exception of Roger, who I think I got your answering machine or something, but it, it by the way it says it's a landline. Is that still a landline? It is. Really? Yeah. I have an office landline and my cell. <laughs> Something's never changed, Pat. Come on. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so to them, 
I owe a huge debt of gratitude. And thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> We're going to walk through 40 years, 40 plus years of pinball. And give me just a second here, straighten out this mess. So here we go. We're going to walk through 40 years of pinball with some of the people who who were there, who lived it, who breathed it. Um, and the, the reason I chose these people uh, from, from, you know, the vast group I could have, these people are experts at their particular part of the business. Okay, so... If I'm standing back in your place and I'm looking up here, I'm seeing a game designer. I'm seeing a licensing guy. I'm seeing a world-class artist. I'm seeing a guy who's largely responsible for most of the features you find in a pinball all the way till today, okay? I see a composer who's a world-class composer who sits down with his book thinks up a tune, writes it down, and says no, and changes a note. Okay? <laughs> I see a software guy who helped bring pinball into the 21st century when he was handed a whole lot of stuff, and he had to make sense of it. And I see a guy who, when he was asked to in the middle of a pandemic, helped build a factory. Okay? They've all done that. They've all lived it. And by the way, there's an operator sitting up there. <laughs> okay, an operator. How many operators we have here tonight? I always ask that question when I had the Pat Lawler show. Big round of applause. An operator who not only operated, he had to fix his own games like you operators do, and then he decided that he wanted to own a pinball company or at least sell pinball machines. Everybody tried to talk him out of it. Then he decided he wanted to make pinball machines. Everybody tried to talk him out of it. He did it anyway, and he's here tonight, and he's going to tell you what it's like to have lived doing that. So I'm looking forward to having a great time tonight. I'm looking forward to having a little bit of time at the end with you folks to ask questions of these people, okay? Um, and I know there are some people in the audience that if I can get away with it, I'm gonna stick a microphone in their face too, so. All right, without further ado, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna make two premises of what we're, we're up to here. First one is a pinball machine is a snapshot in time. It freezes technology. It freezes what the people at the time were thinking about culture. Okay? And once you've built it, it never changes. And you folks are lucky you can walk through Rob's wonderful expo and you can play all those 40 and 50 and 60 years of pinball machines. I've got one more secret to tell you when you're playing those games. When I first got in the business, I was working for an R&D group that was part of Bally. And at the we're, we're, we're redesigning uh, the situation here. Hey, bucko. That's it's, only it's, it's already gone off the rails. <laughs> Carry on. Carry on, bucko. Carry on. Pro problem solved. <laughs> so now I'm going to look at Greg, and I'm going to say the following names. Hank Ross and Dave Morofsky. Okay. <laughs> and I'm going to say when we used to go to shows, and we'd all end up in a suite after those video game shows, remember? Were you, you were part of that. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Dave Morofsky, who was the president of Bally at the time, told me a secret. He said, when you go out on that show floor tonight or today, there's one thing you should be doing. And I said, what's that, sir? Because he was in charge of Bally and I just started in the business. And he said, no matter what game you're playing, look for that one thing in that game that you can put in your back pocket for later. Okay? What's the one thing you're going to play? It might have been the worst game that was out at that trade show. It might have been horrible. After, after Pac-Man was such an incredible hit, the next show, every single video game had things eating other things. Okay? But the idea was, as a game designer, you go out and you walk that show. You play the games and find the one thing that somebody did that piqued your interest and put it in your back pocket and maybe you'll use it again another day. And about 10 years later, I watched a guy named Larry DeMar do that in spades. He never forgot a thing that he saw that was interesting. What I'm going to ask these guys to do is, starting with Mr. Jack, no, Steve. Okay, we'll go with Steve. I want, them to, I want them to tell us a little bit about yourselves. We're going to run through the list. They're going to tell me a little bit about it. And what we've got is we've just got the, some of the highlights of their career up here, and then their games are going to be up there. So you don't, have to do, you don't have to stare at that. Just tell us about yourself and what you've done and when you started in the business, what year. Go for it. Um, I started at Atari in 1974. I just I was in rock and roll bands and uh, you know trying to make money and I wasn't making much. So I walked in the door of Atari and all, there's these beautiful young ladies uh, sitting there and I don't know it was a happy place. Uh, I walked into the main main room for an interview and a rubber pizza flew over my head and. Uh, <clears throat> this crazy man, Nolan Bushnell. I was employee number 50, so it was a very small company. And um, wow, <laughs> here's an incredible thing. You got to remember, this is Los Gatos in California in the 70s. Okay, on the repair table every Friday would be a big tray of hash brownies. <clears throat> and everybody in the company, everybody in the company ate them, ate them. And I'm working on a burn-in oven in my first year there, and I'm thinking, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I might get electrocuted. And there was huge current going through these, and they could burn in 100 boards at once. So Atari was a fun place to work. It was crazy. They um, they insisted on using rotor, rotary solenoids, and it's like, mm, even though I, I mean, I had played pinball as a kid a lot. I, my parents were in a bowling league probably from seven on. My dad loved to play them, and he was a cheater. He would go to the grocery stores in the 30s and drill holes in the side and stick a wire in and hit the switch until he got a bunch of credits and, they'd, and then walk out with a bunch of candy and bad stuff to eat. <clears throat> so he cheated, but he also took me to his place, and we had a, you know, like, it's like Playland at the Beach. That's what it was called in San Francisco. It's long gone. And... uh they had the games there, and they were all bolted in. Anyway, back at Atari, um, things got going, and they said, you want to be part of a uh, pinball division? So I said, sure. And um, uh, I, I went with this guy named Bob Jonas. He, he told everyone there that he was a game designer, but later we found out he was a mechanical engineer. Nevertheless, he told the truth. He said, Atari's never going to be successful at this. He would say that every day, and I'm thinking, Really? I don't know. I mean, we got to try, right? Yeah. Anyway, so we did that. And uh, hmm. after Atari, I, I, this is where I met my, my, um, my connection on the outside of pinball, Roger Sharp. He came to Atari, and he, he played my game. And, um, you know, he was like uh, a character, no doubt. Still a character. <laughs> no doubt. But anyway, he... Uh, I think he knew I wanted out of there. I finished uh, a game called Airborne Avenger, made by a punk who didn't know what he was doing. Uh, there are some shots you can't really shoot. Yep. <laughs> Maybe the ball will roll in there, you know. Anyway, uh, and then, but Superman went better, and that's when I really 
you know, started working on my chops of making a smooth playing game instead of, you know, a, a kind of like stodgy fall guides and stuff that kind of terminate a shot. There's, there was a few games that had some flow, but not much. When I was into making flowy games, I wanted to do that. So um, Roger, I think he gave the word to uh, the president at, um, at Williams, Mike Stroll, a young guy, a crazy guy, a fun guy. Fun guy, get it? <laughs> but he wasn't poisonous. He was not poisonous. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I he made an offer I could not have refused. I brought Eugene Jarvis with me to the interview, and Eugene was intrigued. But yeah, look, Eugene. <laughs> Eugene's a badass. Okay. Anyway, he didn't want to go. He didn't want to leave California at the time, so. We, uh, you know, I did. I went, and a year later, he wanted to come back. And then I, when I got there, I did Flash, and it was sold like, yeah, the most games I ever sold of anything. I, I mean, I don't know. It was a combination of a bunch of things. Here was a real pinball factory with, with real uh, machinery. They could make anything. There was a manufacturing company. That means they could stamp out refrigerators if they wanted to, or car doors, or any damn thing you wanted to make. They had all the tools and all these people, uh, like for now, ball guides. We always, our ball guides now are like made on the outside. We, we make a drawing when they come in, they're either right or wrong, uh, and that's it. But at Williams, you could go, hey, knock off that tab right there and move it over here, and you could have it in the same day, you know, the correct way it was supposed to be before you screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Great place to work. I mean, I learned so much uh, from all the old guys there, and they're younger than me now. Uh, I'm thinking like Jack Sakai and uh, uh, not her viewer so much. I'm, th <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, I don't know, a whole, uh, uh, just a lot of people there who knew how to – John Young. He was great. He was a great mechanical engineer. Anyway, these people taught me so much, and then – and then this punk comes to the company. He's like, you know, he's a punk. The first thing he said was, Flash sucks. <laughs> he's sitting right there in that blue shirt. <laughs> he was kind of right. The software was not deep. You know, Pat, Pat's trying to have us talk about standout important games in the 40-year timeline. And Flash was on my sh on the the first one there you go. in the modern pinball zone, but I think I've got to take it off now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, that was a good thing. Anyway, when Flash was finished, Eugene decided to come out, so we we started working together on Firepower, and we had you know this awesome plan and. It was going to be the first solid state multi-ball game, and it would be equalized. So if you were playing against somebody, you know, you could steal their ball or get it back, you know, if you if you played skillfully enough. It was definitely a, a, a great competitive game. And we did a lot of other things. Eugene had three bites left in the game when he was done. It was definitely revolutionary. It's like we had dancing numbers in the display, and uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, speech. Fire, power, you are destroyed. I did that. You know, I had 11 seconds to say every word, and then we'd reassemble them. <laughs> anyway, uh, after that, let's see. Uh, Black Knight. Black Knight, the guy in the blue shirt here, Larry DeMar, uh, and I made that game. Larry, Larry came up with, was it Jackpot? On high speed, sorry. Okay, on on Black Knight, I think I came up with "Hurry Up," but you made it work. Oh, I'm lying. <laughs> <laughs> how, how the memories do do fade. Uh, <laughs> memories do fade. Bla Bla Black Knight, we had the scoring multipliers in multi-ball. You had Magnus save. Yeah. You had the two-level play field. You had the time drop target. Yeah. It was the uh -huh. first first two level game, okay, multi level we're, game. We're gonna, we're gonna bonus get to the bonus game. ball. Yep. <laughs> we're gonna get to the games in a minute. Okay, after you've introduced yourselves. So we'll get back. We're gonna come back to the games. Okay, that's important. That's fine. Tell me. Take just a minute and tell me what it was like. 
physically doing your job every day, and by that I mean you were drawing on a drawing board, right? Yeah, come on over here, will you? I mean, the speakers are over there, and I'm deaf as a fence post, okay? That's how it is, so I need to read his lips while he's speaking. That's okay. So, damn right it's okay. Business back then. When I was doing my job, job. you were drawing on a drawing board. I was a big old uh, Hamilton electric, eight foot long drafting table. With, you, it could tilt and it went up and down electrically and had a big tray, which I was determined to fill up with uh, racer shavings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we had to use an electric racer to get the stuff off the mylar. If you drew some or made a mistake, if you wanted to change something, you you would make an underlay and tape it up underneath the game to move things around. It was very con tedious, but it was a good experience. Yeah, we, I mean, we did have a really cool Muto drafting machine that was digital. Yeah. <clears throat> I, one of the things we're going to do here is we're going to walk you through what we've all seen technically. Okay, where we started, we were drawing on drawing boards with pencils. And whenever somebody in mechanical engineering wanted to draw a cabinet, for example, they had a six-foot drawing table. And these people sat there drawing full-size representations of cabinets. And we'll get to, you know, 2024 shortly with that. I'm pretty sure mine was eight feet long. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll get Don't back laugh. That's not funny. All we'll, right. get, we'll get back to the games in a minute. Wait, say it again. Let's, let, we'll get back to the games in a minute. Okay. So let's move on to Roger. Hey, just remember, I, you know, I'm the first guy to go, and I didn't know anything about your format. That's okay. That's fine. There's no manual. <laughs> There's no manual. There is, there is no handbook. There we go. But you didn't answer the homework re we, response. We had question. six rehearsals for this. <laughs> it has been grueling. Right. All right, we're up to Roger. Roger, tell us about yourself in the industry. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, 1974. So the genesis for this was uh, wanting to get my own pinball machine. I would not be here. Potentially you guys would not be here. Obviously the law in New York would not have changed. There would have been no book, no movie, no anything, uh, let alone anything for either of my sons to be in this industry. Uh, but uh, an opportunity to uh, actually start doing some research. And I told the story before, but I will repeat it, try to be as brief as possible. Um, there were uh, distributorships in New York City uh, along 10th Avenue, and I visited uh, Al Simon, was the distributor for Williams. This is uh, 1974, toward the end of the year. And uh, lo and behold, there was a new fellow who had just started with the company. His dad, Sam, I guess, thought that maybe being involved with Williams was maybe better than being a full-time attorney. And I was introduced to Gary Stern for the first time. Uh, back then, I had much more of a comprehensive photographic memory uh, than I do now. But uh, the game that they had that they just got in was a game called Big Ben, which premiered in 1975. Uh, I had never really met with anybody other than the distributor salespeople, Mondial down in New Jersey and along 10th Avenue. And I asked Gary what I thought was a very simple question because I had had a chance going to the Jersey Shore to play a lot of games. And I said, so when you guys were designing this, uh, did you automatically just take Starpool and do that outside lane like that? And did you do these targets? And I rattled off about five, six or seven different Williams games that I thought was the whole genesis of how they created games. And Gary was somewhat dumbfounded, didn't have a lot of answers for me. A couple of months later, I arrived at my first MOA show. It's now the AMOA show, but it was the amusement show in Chicago. And uh, one of the first places I went to was the Williams booth. And lo and behold, there was Gary. And at that point in time, I had started making inquiries for my book, the article that appeared in GQ, as well as the feature I did in New York Times, are already kind of getting into um, print. But um, Gary said, oh, Roger Sharp, he's working on a book. Ask him anything about pinball. He will tell you things and blah, 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 blah. That was my introduction. And uh, Steve Kordak, Bill DeSelm, Al Dianzillo, uh, I mean, the whole group of folks uh, I wound up uh, getting the opportunity to meet with. And that was 
that was my start. The rest of it kind of took off from there. Try to be quick. I did. I did pretty good on that. I think. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't. I didn't digress. I. I have to. I have to be honest. I haven't. I didn't get to these guys before we did this, and so I. It's like do a five-minute introduction. There. That's easy. Um, these were Rogers notable pinball games, and we'll get to some of those in a little bit. Um, we're uh, we're up to Jack. Jack, tell us about getting in the business, and uh, and and you know, your life story. Well, it was 1975. I graduated high school. I was supposed to go to college for electrical engineering. Something told me that I wanted to go to work. Uh, my electronics teacher said, if you go to work, you're not going to go to school. I said, no, that's not going to be happening. So I got a newspaper. I answered an ad in the newspaper for a pinball mechanic. That's what it was. I said, I had a friend in electronics class that was working for another company in Brooklyn repairing pinball machines. And I was a lot better technician than he was. And I said, well, if Scott could fix pinball machines, I guess I could. So uh, I called up, went downtown to Times Square to uh, Faber's Fascination downstairs of that building. I had an interview with a gentleman that I'm still friends with today, Steve Schulman. And um, I got home, and my answering machine was blinking. And it was him saying, could you come in tomorrow for another interview? And I went back to Times Square by subway, and I met a guy they told me the guy's in the business 30 years. I'm 17 years old. The guy's like 30 years in the business. He must be dead. <laughs> so some guy walks in with a cigar in his face and his glasses half down. And he comes over to me and he says, you know how to read a schematic? He was German. I said, uh, yeah. You know how to solder? Yeah. All right, I like you. You're hired. Uh, ten minutes later, I'm carrying bowling ball bags through Times Square, and I was sure we weren't going bowling. They were full of quarters. And uh, we were on our way to Brooklyn College. They had The company was Jepco Amusements, and they had a lot of college locations in the New York metropolitan area. And I started fixing pinball machines. The first game we went to, uh, I, you know, 1975, it was a uh, high-low ace. And um, he opened it up, and I had the feeling like I was going to cry in kindergarten with your mom leaving you there. I said to myself, what the f is in this game? But I didn't cry. He taught me well. You know, I'll say this uh, for the Germans in general. We would fix games after a while together as a team, and um, we'd be done with the location or done with the game. He would take the game and put it on its side, tip it sideways, and kick the bottom of the cabinet. And I said, this guy's insane. <laughs> and a whole bunch of screws... And all kinds of assorted parts would come to the side of the cabinet. And he would take every screw and find where it fell out of the game. Okay? And I said to him, him, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, yeah. If the manufacturer meant for there to be one less screw in the game, it would have one less screw. So I learned that, first of all, there were two other pinball mechanics working for the company at that time when I started. I had a beeper and a car. I was like, hot shit. Wow, this is great. I got a beeper. I look like a doctor. I have a car. That's great. I get to go to colleges where I actually should be with all the people my own age. I'm going to parties and rascalers and all kinds of stuff. It was a lot of fun. And... You know, I, I did that until they sold the company. They sold half the company with me. I went with the other half of the company, and then the rest is history. I became an operator. We could get into that.
the story. There, I never knew that. There are, there are people who think that, by the way, that an operator's job is just to go collect the money out of the game and then walk away. Um, actually, there, there's two things that an operator has to be really good at, especially in pinball. One is, can you fix the game? Okay. Uh, and... Uh, and as the sales guy, when I got to Williams, used to tell me, you know what operators are? They're in the moving business. Yeah. They pick up their games, and they have to move them from location to location to make it look like they're new. And so the game sits in a location for six weeks. They pick it up and move it. They're in the moving business. Uh, and I have a lot of respect for operators. All right, we're going to move on to my friend Greg. And uh, Greg, tell us about going to work for Bally. Sure. Is this on? Is it? Oh, okay. If I use twos, it's stereo. Um, <laughs> so here's a, a three, a surround. All right. Thank, thank you, Chris. All right, here we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here, I'm, I'm here to announce my, I'm going to run for president. Um, <laughs> no. No way. Hey. Let's talk about Bally. I uh, met Kevin O'Connor in the business of advertising. We were working at a small company in Morton Grove, Illinois, and uh, he joined after I joined, and he was some kind of hot shot, uh, you know, point of purchase game, uh, uh, des designer. And I learned a little bit from him, but he was only there six months, got a job at Bally and called me up. Thank you, Kevin. Um, he said, hey, you really need to think about coming to Bally because they're going to hire another illustrator, in-house illustrator. In-house illustrators are unheard of. But he called me. He said, uh, you're going to have to interview with Paul Ferris. I, uh, I did all of that. I met Kevin literally at a club that his band played at and showed him some of my stuff before he, he kind of vetted it and said, yeah, don't show that, but uh, you can show these to Paul. So I did, and I, I did these pieces especially to get the job. I had nothing before that because I was a fine art major, and uh, that, didn't, you know, that didn't integrate with uh, the illustration that I was really chasing. Anyway. Uh, I get the interview with Paul. He goes, we got one guy that's better than you, but you have darkroom experience. And I think that's going to be valuable to us in the future because I'm setting up an in-house darkroom too. So you can run that and you can work on uh, illustration in your spare time. I was like, I'm in. So uh, they hired me. I did a special little piece for them. Uh, called Summertime, and it eventually kind of looked like skateball, um, and uh, it was, you know, a wonderful time to be at Bally. Uh, we had a great art department run by Paul Ferris. Kevin was there, Margaret Hudson. Uh, it was just great times, uh, and I finally look back on the Bally days. But then I got sold with the furniture um, to uh, Williams, and that was even better. Uh, because Williams, uh, un, you know, under working under Ken Fedesna and, uh, you know, everybody, it, it was like they gave us so much freedom, so much freedom to just come up with what we want, you know. And, and I, I appreciate Williams and everybody that ran Williams for allowing that type of design freedom. Uh, and then... After that, I spent a stint in the video game business, a fish out of water days, uh, for me anyway. And then uh, I got back into the business by creating a little thing called Wonelli and got uh, some people interested in that. Uh, George Gomez, uh, after I worked with Jack for just a short amount of time on The Wizard of Oz, uh, I got a call from George Gomez and he said, uh, why don't you come over to our side of the fence? And so uh, I talked to Jack, and, you know, Jack was sad to see me go, weren't you? Anyway. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I ended up at Stern and finished my career uh, this year at Stern uh, as uh, 46 years of uh, whatever this is. So thank you.
two two things two things before we get to Larry. Uh, first of all, uh, Greg's another perfect example of living through technological change. Okay, he's talking about having a dark room in a place, right? Nobody in their right mind would have a dark room today because they'd have no use for it. It's all digital. And through 40 years of having to relearn and relearn and relearn your craft, okay, that's what it takes to, to stay relevant. There's another thing when we get to the games and the eras that we're going to talk about, and he touched on it for just a second here. In this business, you're only as good as your last game, and the company might go away tomorrow, okay? It's a tough business to make a living in for 40 years. It's tough. Larry, tell us about yourself and getting in the business. All right, I, I have to start with something else. And 40 years ago was the first Pinball Expo. It was 1985. Um, it was pretty small compared to this. And we had the the greats of the time. We had uh, Wayne Nyan, Steve Kordick, Norm Clark, Harvey Heiss, um, Alvin Gottlieb um, were all there. And these were these guys that for the 40 years before the first Pinball Expo had done it all and evolved and innovated and created the ongoing timeline that we walked in and out to be a part of. Yep. Um, unlike 2024, um, there was no internet. There was, there was not much material out there. And so even us, most of us in the business really didn't understand the history that well. It was guys like Rob who who collected and, and mined and, and tried to find out everything about everyone, that group of historians that, that knew all about these guys that we met the first time in 1985, except that I lived down the block from Alvin Gottlieb growing up, another story. Um, now we are the... <laughs> We we are the we are the old we we are the old guys and um and it's it's good to know that that many of you have had a lot of fun um, with the things that we've created because that's probably doing this is we're all overgrown kids okay and the old guys at the first pinball expo were all overgrown kids um, it, it's just unbelievable. Um, Greg brought up Ken Fidesna, and he had to manage a building full of toddlers that 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 all felt they were more important than the company. Um, and talking about the little dribs and drabs of history, I was in college when this beautiful book, illustrated by Hamilton, written by Sharp came on the shelves and, and I had nothing. I mean, there was no, I, I love pinball. I majored in computer science and minored in pinball. Um, if I wasn't findable, it was either the base, the pinball machines in the basement of our dorm or over at the pinball room at the student center. Um, and Roger Sharp's book appears and all of a sudden, you know, boom, we, we, we get to, to have something for pinball. And it's amazing how in every, sector or area um, it has just 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 mushroomed where we've got all of these collectors today here coming here to have fun coming here to meet other collectors and all of you have different niche, niches of the of the pinball continuum um, you know that's of interest to you and, and it's um, refreshing to see that the leagues um, and the tournaments, which again have, have just, I mean, pinball is on its way to becoming a professional sport. And it's, yep. it's again, like, like we've watched 40 years of this, we've watched that evolve both in tournaments, um, and, and in, you know, video productions that are getting bigger and bigger, um, and technology. So I don't know what it's, oh, there's some game, there's some games I did. It was the manufacturers versus the 
general player. So representing the manufacturers from parts unknown, Larry DeMar against uh, Steve Engel from Mayfair. <laughs> Steve Engel won. I still can't believe he won. But that talks about some of the early years, Larry, if you remember that. Yeah. Well, it's really funny because when they decided to have a pinball tournament the first year, and the first tournament was on Pinbot in 86, it was probably the second show. Um, might have been the third show. Second show. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, and I was going somewhere with this. Oh, right, they had a tournament on Pinbot, and I was I was a pretty good player in my time. But they were scared that all of us at the manufacturers were, we knew too much and had too much practice and whatever, and they had this delusion that they needed to save the regular playing audience from the manufacturing group. And um, it really was, was far the other way around. By giving us this little manufacturing group to work in, I actually was one of the, the better players in the group um, where I couldn't hold a candle on the other side of the uh, tournament. Yeah, they set it up so that it was uh, the regular players, and we had a manufacturer's division, and then I think Rob initiated the fact that whoever won the regular tournament would have to face off against the winner of the manufacturers. So. Right, and I won that three times against players that were far my superior, but the regular tournament player was playing for a pinball machine. And just before stepping up to play for the six-foot trophy, they had just won their pinball machine. And I would just catch them, you know, a little too cocky or worn out or whatever. And uh, and three, t I beat John Norris one year, and he still yep. talks about it. Yep. <laughs> and I don't, I can't hold a candle to his skills. Here's, here's a deep dark secret in in pinball companies. Almost all the people who work there are terrible at playing pinball. And and by the way, if you're a smart game designer, you keep it that way. Because that way you think like the general public. You don't think like somebody who's going to play in a tournament. Carry okay. on. I'm just going to go with a little bit now. Um, I, I did um, operating systems. I did software rules, co-design games with the designers. Um, but I always considered myself kind of a Bernie Taupin type of character. Except I didn't work with Elton John. I worked with several Elton Johns. I worked with Pat, did games with Pat, did games with Steve, did games with Barry, did games with John Papaduke. And of our of our uh, geezer set here, um, uh, just to back up a, a moment, when we when we did the email to organize this, um, Pat sent some something out to all of us. We want to do this. Here's what we're doing. Whatever. Jack responded, yeah, you, you all were really instrumental in getting pinball to where it is, except Larry. <laughs> <laughs> and so as I look at this panel, okay, of, um, I have worked directly with everyone on this panel, except Jack. Yep. <laughs> and with that, I, 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 think, I think actually what I wrote you was, um, oh, here it is. Go to the tape. Well, <laughs> I said everybody was instrumental in the in the success of of Jersey Jack Pinball, and then I forgot that you gave us some employees that are very treasured. So I apologize for that oversight. <laughs> we'll have a cage match later. <laughs> All right. Chris, Chris, tell us about getting in the business and uh, and all the nice changes you've seen. W wow. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and good night. Uh, good night and good luck. Um, okay, okay. All right, wow. Um, I, uh, I started with Williams in 1986. Uh, I had been out of school for a couple of years. I almost started with Gottlieb, actually, or with Milestar, is what it was called at the time. Um, in, I, I, I finished a master's degree in, com in, in music composition at the University of Illinois, 
with a specialty in computer music. And I'd written software, written software to make funny beeps and boops. And um, I did, I finished that in 83. And um, I hung around town. I was working as a programmer in Champaign. Um, and, uh, and I continued to show up f for the Monday Night Composers Forum events at the School of Music there and continued to have an account on the, the Cyber 175 supercomputer that um, was the main you know, machine at U of I. And um, uh, I wrote programs in Fortran 4 to make beeps and boops. And I had, in like January or February of, of, of 83, I had made, or 84, I had made a little two and a half minute piece of audio. That way it was, it, it was some, I, I mean, I don't even remember what specifically I was thinking about, but it was, it was something that made some beeps and boops, sort of a string of them in a row um, that had several different sort of like oscillations that were happening at the same time. One sort of goofy sound after another, it was literally, the kinds of beeps and boops, well, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, uh, in February of 84, a bunch of people from the Northwestern Computer Music Department came down to Urbana and gave a presentation to my department. And it was so cool, and they were up to such cool stuff that I went up to the guy, his name is Gary Kendall, afterwards, and said, my God, I love what, you, what you're up to, and I love that you're gonna buy this new computer, and I love that you're into these, you know, these new Yamaha FM synthesizers, and, and what a cool place, how can I be a part of it? And he said, just come. He said, don't you like, you know, do you, do you, like, do you like games? He said, I can get you a job. I said, really? And he said, yeah, I've got a guy, you know, one of my students works at this place called Milestar, and, and I happen to know they're looking for somebody. Why don't you, come, you know, why don't you apply for this job? So I, so Craig Beierwaltz, is that how you say his name? Beerwaltz? Yeah, Beerwaltz. Anyway, um, he was running, the, running the, the engineering group there, and I sent him this little tape, and he called me up, and he said, my God, how did you make that thing? And I said, well, it was this little Fortran 4 program that I made, and, you know, and, and he said, what did it run on? I said, it runs on the Cyber 175 <laughs> supercomputer. <laughs> and, and he goes, so what you've done, he, he goes, this thing sounds exactly like my games. All my games sound exactly like this. He said, basically what you've done here is you've turned an $18 million supercomputer <laughs> and made it sound like a $75, 6800 <laughs> microprocessor playing through an 8-bit D to A converter. <laughs> and that was, and that was my actual start. He, he. It turns out I didn't go to work for Milestar because they had a hiring freeze. And by the time the hiring freeze was lifted, I had already found another job up in Chicago. And I worked as a programmer for another 18 months before Williams came along and put the first Yamaha FM synthesis chip into the first pinball game, which happened to be Road King's Mark Ritchie's game. And that was my. And so I showed up there, and 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 Ken Fedesna again said. So we're looking for somebody who can write music in assembly language. And I, and I said, well, I have a master's in that, actually. So, so I, was, I, I, w I was in, I, I couldn't have been in the writer place at the writer time. And I got to write music in assembly language using the, the, the basic reconfigure actual, reconfigurable editor and information for editing and information Files or something like brief. We all use brief. We all use to do brief. Our program. And and Larry wrote all these great macros for us to use. And um, and I was literally writing note C4 14, note C5 15, and and just I, I got very very fast at, at writing those notes. And that was that was that was me writing music in assembly language. And that's how we did it for several and, years. And for us and probably the industry, Chris was the point person at the crossover. Pre-Chris at Williams, the music and sounds were all made by geeks, okay, writing computer programs to just make the computer make interesting sounds using waveforms and the like. And Chris, um, it, so it sounds, you know, he was more hybrid because he was programming and was the first to start using the synthesizer but he was the first musician that we had that wrote music and applied it to pinball. I, I like to say that I uh, that that before I got there, um, making sound for games was a was a uh, was a software problem. And after I got there, at the point where that Yamaha chip arrived, making sound for a pinball game became a musical problem. 
and I was a I was the right tool for the job to solve that problem. So that was my start, and we can we can go from there. Okay. And 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 it was an interesting evolution that I was right in the middle of where um, the programmer. The programmers made the sounds, wrote the software, and did all that. And when when we had other people making sounds, they would make sounds, and we would decide what they were. And we would, um, you know, put them in the game or move them around. And in the in in my first experience with a sound designer was Brian Schmidt on Bonsai Run. And um, I, you know, he'd give me sounds. I didn't like this one here, so I put it there. And he'd like like. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, yeah, like what's what's that? And and there was kind of a little tug of war at the beginning over you know who's controlling what this game sounds like, and you know Brian taught me and I learned and and the whole method of making audio for pinballs really had a revolution in that time. It's important for it's important that 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 we acknowledge Brian. In, at, at this time because Brian trained Larry. So the, by the time <laughs> I got to Larry, Larry was, was very respectful of sound guys and musicians and, and, and we got along just fine. We did very well. All right. We're up with Bill. Bill's going to... We got uh, a short cord here. Is there any more? Got a short cord. Gotcha. Sure. <laughs> All right. Well, I just got two quick anecdotes uh, from things we've talked about before. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. First one is for Steve. Steve and I actually were learning AutoCAD at about the same time at Williams. And I just remember Steve just tearing his hair out because he couldn't have a monitor that would allow him to draw a play field actual size. <laughs> so, but he's learned how to print them. Yes, he still prints them actual size, but he's learned how to draw on a monitor that's much smaller. So. And the second one is um, um, Chris and Larry talked about using Brief to program in. And when I got there, the the programming environment in Brief was very mature, and there were tons of macros and things you could do in Brief that were just amazing. But it had this habit of crashing about 40 times a day. And every single person that used it had this impulsive thing that would save the file. Just, it was, you know, Alt-S, Alt-S. Alt and when you weren't thinking, you would just Alt-S. I still do that to this day. It's just, <laughs> it's baked in my mind that if I don't do that, I'm going to lose something. If you, you know? if you programmed in the early 80s, like I got into the business because I was a programmer in 1980, okay? That was a, a gut level reaction you did every five minutes on whatever you were programming in. Whatever the keystroke combination was, save this file, you just went bang. And for years after that, when I'm sitting at a computer, I'm the same way. You just, how do I save this thing? Still, do it. Still do it. Uh, still do it. Still do it. Still do it. Still do it. All right. Uh, so my name is Bill Grupp. Um, so my story starts in pinball. Uh, I got out of college in 1991. It was the height of a recession, and there were no jobs anywhere. There was not a single company that came to interview at our school. Um, nothing. And so I, I was sending out resumes. I probably send out 75 to 100 resumes to people. Um, very little response. I had a few interviews. I started sending out resumes on fluorescent colored envelopes because that was the only way I could get people to actually open them up because, uh, you know, the, the, you get hundreds of, of resumes in the mail and they all look the same. So when the fluorescent envelopes started going out, I started getting interviews. Um, and one of the interviews I got was uh, at uh, the Midway Games Company, which was at the time in the same building, you know, 3401 California, uh, with Kerry Mendick. And, you know, the long walk through the factory to get back to the Midway area. And I remember sitting down. It's this really dark room. The entire place had almost no lighting in it. A couple little desk lights here and there. But this really dark room. And I'm staring at Carrie. And, you know, he's talking a little bit about what they do and what kind of stuff. that. And uh, But I'm not focused at all on what he's saying. I'm looking at his desk. And it's a big desk. Everybody had big desks at the time. And spread out across his desk is his computer. And it's an early, you know, PC type computer, and it's totally disassembled. It's you know the power supply, the motherboard, the hard drive, everything totally disassembled. There's no case at all. It's in little pieces all over, and there's a monitor, and it's working. He's typing on it. It's running in little pieces all over his desk, and I'm just sitting there looking at it, going, "It looks just like mine at home." <laughs> so, 
But I didn't get that job. He didn't hire me. So, uh, so same thing. Went months and months. You know, a couple interviews. Never, never got any response. So I ended up uh, applying at a temporary agency, and uh, and they're like, you know, well, well, what kind of stuff you can do? Well, I said, you know, I know how to program a little bit, and I do some electrical stuff, and I can solder. And they go, you can solder? And they're like, we got the place for you. And so I, you know. The next Monday morning, they walked me in the door to 3401 California <laughs> Pinball Factory, and I'm, you know, I'm working on the line. And in, it, it's, it turns out they didn't really need me to solder. I ended up working as a final tester on the line. Um, and so testing pinball machines. They were building Adams Family at the time. They were building 160 Adams Family a day. Um, you know, incredible uh, number of games. And then they're off in the corner, they're building um, 60 getaways a day at the same time, right? Um, but then the, the thing that I figured out was that where I was working in the factory, there was this walkway that went from the front door all the way through the factory to the back entrance to where engineering was. And, the, you know, there's this green wall that's about four feet tall that separated the factory from the walkway so you didn't get hurt. And in, in the morning, all the people in engineering walked through, and at lunchtime, half of them came out, went to lunch, and they all went back through. And so I started, you know, introducing myself, and I'm standing next to this wall, and the pinball machine on one side, and these guys are all, so I started introduc introducing myself to these people in engineering as they walked by. And, um, and I met uh, Chuck Blake, who was in charge of electrical, and, you know, and so he knew who I was, and I, you know, I talked to him about what, you know, what I did and what I liked to do. And, and um, several months later, this is probably early 1992 now, um, a bunch of people from engineering left to start Capcom Pinball. So Mark Johnson, or Paul Johnson, Mark Cotabella, um, Mark Ritchie, uh, Python, they all left. Well, it opened up a bunch of spots in engineering, and um, probably two weeks after they left, Chuck came to talk to me, and he says, I have a position. Would you be interested? And in electrical engineering, and I, I said yes, I, I definitely would, um, and I started working doing cable design for pinball machines under when Chuck. Uh, that was much later, much oh, later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I actually did the cables for Star Trek: Next Generation. Yeah, that's that's how I met Steve. So, um, and it while to me that that's the reason why the cannon wires broke. Just yes, last week. Yes, that's Just my, last week cannon, he said that. If your cannon wires break, that is my fault. Yeah. But, yes, that is, I will I will accept that. That is my fault, yes. Um, but I will also say you can completely remove the lower trough without touching a single wire. That whole thing comes off. The cables go all the way around that stupid S-shaped thing without touching it. Two diverters and four switches on the lower wire. We started using flex wire, which is a whole lot of very small diameter conductors in one wire, and it could flex millions of times, but we didn't have it then. I, I don't even know if it was invented. Yeah. <coughs> so, so one of my duties as you know the cable guy in the electrical engineering department was to set up and build more of the development systems that the programmers used. It, it was at the time it was called the Orkin system because it was you used it to kill the bugs. And um, so I, you know, and and they they were they were finicky. They were boxes with lots of cables, ribbon cables, and and connectors that made it work on a pinball machine. So they needed a lot of service, and I had to build a couple new ones. And and so I actually built one for myself, and um, you know got it up and running, and started playing with it a bit, and talked to some of the other programmers about how you know how to get it working to make sure it was working. And um, and I actually wrote a, a little program that would play Breakout on the Lamp Matrix. Um, and that's how I met Larry DeMar. <laughs> so, um, and eventually uh, an opening in the software department showed up and I was able to take that position too. You just witnessed something that is also true about people in the game business. They have a very long memory and they will always carry a grudge. You did what with the cannon on Star Trek? It's pretty funny, it, but it's true. And and we remember those those little bitty details. You remember them like they were, you know, yesterday. I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and I'm 
I'm re Ken Podesna sitting back there. I remember things that he and I talked about 40 years ago or 30 years ago. It's unbelievable. Keith, go for it. So I started off my pinball career um, probably like a lot of you. I played pinball. Uh, started playing it significantly in college. Um, Worldwind was the first game that taught me there were rules. Um, and then a couple of years after that, I uh, learned about uh, Usenet and rec.games.pinball and uh, started becoming a regular on there, um, developing, a, I'm sure, a bit of a reputation for better or for worse. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then, uh, then late 92, they started talking about this pinball tournament um, in New York City called uh, Papa. And that's when Kevin Martin and I made the long trip from Virginia Tech to New York City in order to participate um, at Papa 3 at, uh, in New York City. And that was a fantastic experience. Um, so years go on, uh, start working out of college, uh, do a lot of database type stuff. And um, as time has gone on, uh, Communities started forming even more. Um, we started, a lot of people started hanging out on IRC a lot. And even even pinball people would hang out on IRC and pound pinball, including Larry and Lewis and, you know, a bunch of other people. And so at one point, Larry just mentions casually, like, looking for people in slots. And uh, I messaged him. I was like, you serious? <laughs> like I was just, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, what, if he was joking or not. And I was like, yeah. So at some point, uh, that expo, I went over and sort of engineered, more talked to them. But I guess it was an interview, but, you know, um, but at the time, I wasn't sure if I wanted to pick up everything from where I was and head out here. I guess we know how that turned out. Um so I talked to people, including some pe some people that uh, I may have, you know, not been so kind to online, <laughs> and uh, so it was a very surreal situation. But after the next Papa, I think it was ninety, I think it was ninety seven. I think it was. I was like, um, or ninety eight. Uh, I, I told Larry, hey, I, I'm interested. You know, if you still got a position. So I came up and worked on spinning real slots for a few months. And then there was a great split in engineering. Like Larry was in charge of both spinning real slots and pinball. And then he got put on just pinball. And at that time, I was asked to, if I wanted to go over to work on Revenge for Mars, um, knowing that it was a sink or swim situation if uh, pinball went out. I was like, work on pinball? Yes, please. <laughs> Um, so worked on Revenge for Mars, which is an amazing thing. Just being a part of Williams Engineering in general was, uh, one of the best things that I ever was associated with just because of all the history and all the people and all the knowledge and all the passion. It was just an amazing time for me personally. And I'm sure everyone else there, you know, pretty much thought the same way. Um, and then pinball shut down. Uh, you know, a year and a half later. Um, I didn't feel like I was over yet, so I interviewed at Stern and went to Stern, did a few games over there. But still, Stern, I, I will say this, going back to Brief, they tried to foist Brief on me, and, uh, you know, this this was um, 2000 at this point, and uh, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not using Brief. <laughs> so uh, I, I started using Emacs at Williams, because unlike... Unlike Williams, who had a bunch of cool Larry macros and stuff like that, uh, Stern didn't have anything. So there was no point in using it, and yeah, you know, I just kind of split away and yeah, you know, did my own thing. But it turned out all right. And then at some point, Stern shuts down. I take a couple year hiatus, work at Play Mechanics, uh, which is very important for me when I got the Jersey Jack pinball, and. Uh, then started at Jersey Jack in 2011 and haven't looked back since.
I'm going to do this real quickly. Um, I have a concept I would like to uh, talk to you about, Pat. It's called seventh inning stretch. I've been sitting up here for an hour and a half. I'm a geezer. I'm all bent up. I need to move and stand up. Anybody else? <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes. Everybody take a break. Not right now, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Too old. We just... 